I myself entered into the depths of the spirit and mysteriously contemplated God's existence and communed in these blissful moments of the highest life and tasted the joy of salvation, although, of course, only in the pre-betrothal of my feelings. There was no one around me, only nature embraced me with a sweet embrace, full of spiritual peace and deep falling. And so I, from her very womb, like a child on his mother's breast, drank the living streams of true life, participating in the living sensation of the divine, whom our soul always seeks as the only true God, in which alone there is eternal life and bliss. But this exalted state of the soul cannot be found in the midst of a world immersed in vanity and earthly cares. This belongs to a life detached from everything earthly. And I still stood on that high spire above all the mountains, and in the west between the cliffs I saw the famous Elophian Way in this region, from where three rivers flow, Dumbai, Amanus, and Olabek, and behind them I saw a spire called the Beloalaki Mountain. He raises his head above all ridges and mountains, along with the clouds, and he has been standing for many thousands of years, and he still thinks one thought, a strong and great thought, about God's destinies. Why do people live in the world, and why do they honor the Lord so poorly? They love this vain age and its charming life, blessings completely forgetting their eternal life promised to them by God. But I, he says, am not honored by the glory of the image of God and do not have the high gifts in me, freedom and reason. But I have been continuously performing God's service both night and day. For more than one thousand years I stand vigilantly on my guard assigned to me by God. His appearance is like that of a great and brave commander, and he stepped forward with one foot and stands motionless with a stern look for many many years with his head bowed to the east and silently praises the heavenly creator and sends out a new song to the trinity consubstantial and indivisible let it not be reprehensible for me to say here something from my personal experience if silence in general constitutes a necessary element for our spirit in which it has its inner life its movement and development then all the more it is seen in all its inviolability, completeness, and inexplicability in the Caucasus Mountains, in the midst of virgin nature, where there is nothing distracting from God, but on the contrary, everything disposes and attracts to Him. And so out of the excess of delight of our flaming heart, we will say what we have experienced, mountains, mountains of the Caucasus, how you amaze the viewer with your wonderful solemn appearance, the majesty of your location, space, dimension, and beauty beauty, and there is no way to depict you in writing as a great spectacle of the hands of God, to draw your beauty of mountain ranges, to convey the thoughts and feelings that you produce. When they see you, thoughts involuntarily rush to heaven, a strong movement of higher feelings is heard in the heart, and a desert dweller conveniently enters the realm of spiritual life. These mountains are like the thrones of God, and the Most High Lord rests on them, and it is known that everything that is akin to its self strives for something similar to itself, and so does our spirit, wandering through the mountains like a bird. Psalm 10, 1 through 2 comfortably ascends from the heights of the mountains to heaven to the throne of the Almighty. It is here, one might say, that there is a school of God's wisdom. Everything visible here is in its natural, undamaged form. Somehow the presence of the divine is heard closer. The whole vanity of this world, lying in evil, is felt more deeply. The deepest need of our spiritual nature, unity with the Creator, appears more audibly in the soul. The soul itself strives towards God and heartfelt prayer to the Lord Jesus Christ enters into its rightful pretext and spreads like the sea in its boundlessness. Only here does it become clear why the Holy Fathers, great sages, and people with deep minds always sought solitude, and only here could they find satisfaction in the sublime impulses and deep contemplations of their great minds. Here they penetrated into the secrets of God's creation, felt with their heart's inevitable world, which for them was like a visible reality standing before their eyes. Their spiritual eyes were opened, and they entered into direct communication with the spiritual world, and therefore every God-loving soul necessarily loves silence, for it is the presence of the divine. From here the inspired words of St. Gregory the theologian became understandable, and came to mind by the 
themselves when he, burdened by life in crowded Constantinople, occupying the chair of the patriarch, was burning in spirit to fly away from the city like a bird to deserted places and expressed his fiery desire in immortal words. Why am I not a turtle dove and don't have wings so that I can fly somewhere from the evils of this rotating life? I would settle alone in a deserted cave and spend the rest of my days with animals. You can get along with them rather than with people. There my life would flow in peace and tranquility without all worries and sorrows. Or, surpassing dumb creatures with a mind capable of cognizing the divine and ascending from the earthly perseverance to heaven, I, in silent solitude, would begin to collect the rays of the eternal light, and inspired by the love to his neighbors, having ascended to an elevated place, he would have spoken from there these words in the hearing of all earth-born. Mortals born of flesh and blood, if you are nothing more than dust, tossed by the wind like a victim doomed to death, then perhaps your spirit still wanders the earth, chasing the ghosts of perishable happiness. Look with me, who by the goodness of God you have already experienced a lot of good and bad in this life. Everything around you, and you will agree that everything in this world is vanity and ruin of the spirit. Some are famous for their gigantic strength and their height and stature amazed their neighbors. The other was distinguished by his excellent beauty, and everyone's eyes and souls turned to him like the blush of spring. One was not inferior in courage and bravery in war to the ferocious Ares, invincible hero. Another thundered on the lists. The third set his glory in becoming a skilled hunter and killing animals with sharp copper. The fourth was sitting at a table laden with food and drinks to play Please his whimsical belly, both the air and the earth and the sea brought rich gifts. But what now, with the onset of old age, all this flew by like a dream, bodily strength weakened, the face was disfigured by deep wrinkles. No pleasure more flatters the senses, and the decrepit body, having already stepped into the tomb with one foot, bows its head under the axe of death. In the same way, another is proud of his knowledge of many sciences, another celebrity of his kind, or a dignity acquired by his own merits. He occupies the first place in the people's assembly, and one of his words serves as a law for all others. Another, devoted to greed, hoards treasures and constantly worries about multiplying them. It is flattering for one to bear the title of judge and decide controversial cases at his own discretion the other dressed in purple with an elevated brow prescribes the laws of the universe and seems to look with disdain at the inaccessible peaks of heaven itself and o oh, poor things it is in vain that they stretch their hopes so far and think that their glory is immortal it exists as long as we live afterwards having turned to dust we will all be equal to each other subjects with kings begging with the owners of countless treasures. One darkness will cover us all, one grave will imprison us, and in the death of the mighty of the earth has any advantage over the death common to all others. Then is it that their burial is performed with magnificent ceremonies, that a magnificent monument is erected over their ashes, and that their names remain engraved on marble. Oh, sooner or later, but everyone finally has the same lot, each according to the inevitable determination nation of nature will leave behind in the coffin rotted bones and an ugly worm-eaten skull in this gloomy dwelling pride no longer exists unfortunate poverty no longer groans under the burden of labor and disaster there is no longer any vile slander no bloodthirsty revenge no vile deception no greedy self-interest death buries all this with them into the ground and stores it in it until that great day when again rising from the graves we will appear before the judgment of God with our deeds. I have already come a very long way in life, and now stand on the threshold of the grave. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. Avoid the snares set for you by the primordial enemy and destroyer of our race. Direct all your desires to heaven, to the eternal kingdom, where the purest spirits surround the ineffably bright throne of the triune God. Let those ignorant of God, spinning like a rolling ball, turn now to one thing or another, and pursue destructive pleasures. Let them, having eyes covered with darkness, seek with timid feet the path, and gropingly touch the walls and doors opened by our enemy, in order to trap the unfortunate ones in their rivets. I would not have left this mound even 
even before my death, but for lack of food I was forced and reluctant to leave this spiritual chair of heavenly wisdom, wandering here between mountains and abysses, throughout gorges, wilds, and along mountain ledges, in barely passable chasms, I spent quite a bit of time. Sometimes I had to spend the night on a mountain hill, and all around there were flat places, and at night I could hear the presence of countless numbers of animals that were in herds grazed, each in its own place, and especially away from others, the amazed with their extraordinary numbers, and amazing what in new innumerable power of animals hides in the mountains, feeds, multiplies, and lives. No one knows about it unless some hunter gets in here, but even after killing it he won't be able to take it out of here. Chapter 31 View of the mountains in autumn in the desert wild of the Caucasus, in the woods of a hermit. I live in the distant and deserted mountains, and to the best of my ability I pay attention to my inner state, even for the salvation of my soul. Once despondency came upon me, which, according to the recognition of the Holy Fathers and the experience of every hermit, is the death of the soul, a state of unbearable languor, boredom, and despair. Then a person plunges into the depths of hell and cannot calm himself down with anything, even a little, so that according to the Holy Fathers, if the Lord had not quickly stopped this unbearable state, then people would certainly have died from it. At such a bleak time, in a quiet hour of the evening, I went down from the high cliff on which my cell, with the novice, is located, lower on the slope of the Kunachkir River, and sat down on a small and beautiful platform, comfortably lying on a terrible cliff above the river, Kunachkir. The pleasant coolness from both the greenery and the forest that stood around me in all directions, small and large, blew over me with joy and tranquillity, and I took down the river and up it, an indescribable picture of the much artistic wisdom of God. The harsh and unfriendly autumn has already laid its deadening hand on nature. The foliage on the trees has lost its natural color and was painted with shades of all kinds of colors, which in their diversity display such a wondrous and amazing picture that they impose silence on the movement of thought, filling the heart with the liveliest feelings of love and reverence for the great artist and ruler of the world, who so clearly and clearly demonstrated everywhere the wonderful traces of his creativity, wisdom, goodness, and vigilant providence, from the sight of which man truly comes to know his creator and the father of nature. Here on the nearest slope of the mountain, covered with the black forest, there are deciduous trees in a beautiful variety throughout the entire space. From the action of the frost, they turn the mountain into a charming picture of painting, which is inaccessible to the brush of any artist on earth as the work of God's hands. Next to it, you can see a basin, even more striking in the brightness of all kinds of colors. Next is a huge mountain slope descending from the top of a spire to the river in regular ledges, and also along its entire length in all directions one can see an extraordinary mixture of brilliant colors. Each tree, struck by frost, changed its usual green foliage into the color characteristic of its nature, and wherever you look up and down and to the sides, all the slopes of the mountains shine with the luxury of flowery decoration and indescribable beauty. The harsh and deadening autumn has apparently now entered into a dispute with the ruddy spring, inexhaustible in the strength of vegetation. And just as this beautiful spring, rich in blooming beauty, magnificently adorns the face of the earth with the grace of its elegant decoration, showing it like a bride dressed for a crown, so autumn showed its power, decorating the mountains with the decoration of a flowery outfit. But a great difference is heard in the feelings of the heart when seeing the decoration of nature with the beauty of flowers in spring and autumn. No matter how bright and striking the colors of the foliage and frost-stricken trees in autumn are, they are short-lived. Now the rain will pass, the wind will blow, and suddenly all the splendor will disappear. Only bare tree trunks will remain, black like the skeleton of a dead man, and others pale like his cheeks. This type of autumn beauty is reminiscent of the dowager queen who adorned herself in her wedding attire before her death. But alas, it will not bring joy, but only sorrow over the irrevocably past days of a happy life. So now a mournful feeling saddens the soul about the transience of earthly beauties. Everything will pass, but only our soul and its deeds will remain, good and evil, and with them it will go into the next century to God's judgment. 
Thus ended this time my vision of autumn nature, which, having changed the appearance of deciduous trees into a beautiful variety, left coniferous trees in inviolable severity, and in their usual form, which with its gloominess produced a heavy impression, consistent with the autumn time, and perhaps with the constant mood souls of a desert dweller. Chapter 32. View of the Same Mountains in Winter Time. The mountains in the entire mountainous country show a completely different look during winter. Preserving their usual majestic appearance and the thought of God's omnipotence, they are now clothed in white robes and stand like vigilant guards of the house of God, invariably fulfilling their service assigned to them by the Lord. They neither slumber nor fall asleep. They cheerfully stand on their ever-present guard, having no shift and not knowing fatigue. With its high peaks it shows us our mountainous fatherland. By the immutability of their position they also teach us to faithfully, diligently, and steadily serve the Lord God throughout our lives, both night and day. Now not even the slightest sign of life is visible anywhere on them, and yet they simulate the mind to activity by reflecting on the properties of God. By their being they give evidence of God as their creator, demonstrating his omnipotence, all power and strength, his vigilant providence for all things, goodness, and so on. The holy apostles said the truth that God's invisible perfections and his ever-present power are seen by us in the works of his creation. Romans 1.20 the artist is visible in the case. If the works of God are so wondrous, majestic, and indescribable, then what kind of creator should they be? Limitless, unlimited, omnipotent, and omnipresent, King of kings and Lord of lords. The closer winter approaches to spring, the more joyful and comforting our stay in the mountains becomes. Warm, beneficial winds begin to blow. The sun beats the air with brighter and more life-giving rays and delays the day longer. There is variety in the mountains in the morning, evening, and noon. At each of these times a special picture of the mountains is seen, but always solemn, majestic, amazing, and indescribable. In the word, it irresistibly pours into the heart the feeling of God's presence, fear, and reverence, and its complete all ending insignificance before the clear evidence of God's deeds, testifying to his existence and his endless perfections, the mountains with their terrible enormity, the magnitude of their extension, and the height of their spears above the clouds, appear like the thrones of God, and the Almighty rests on them, a wondrous vision, elevating the mind and heart from the level of everyday life. In the morning, when there is no sun yet, emerging late from behind the mountains, they are usually seen covered with a funeral shroud. At this time a cold and sharp wind almost always blows, and the harsh state of the air, having an unfavorable effect on bodily sensation, does not dispose spiritual strength to the movement characteristic of them, to see God existing in all creation, and therefore we rush at this time to take refuge in the hut in warmth and peace. But then at noon I went out to the edge of the cliff where our abode is, high above the level of the river. The blinding rays of the sun, merging with the whiteness of the snow, make it impossible to look at the mountains. They turned, as it were, into a sea of light, brilliance, and unbearable radiance, a wonderful and majestic spectacle. If such an amazing radiance comes from created light, then what must be the uncreated light, the ever-present light, the primordial light of the divine? And now from creation man again ascends to the Creator and comes to know the power of God and His perfections. Chapter 33. My other travels through the Caucasus Mountains and various incidents and adventures happened with me during them. Story. There was not a little of everything, sorrowful and joyful, in which one can clearly see the vigilant providence of God, vigilantly protecting the hermit from everything harmful on all the paths of his toilful life, as the Holy Fathers assure about this in their writings, who by the grace of God passed through this life in mountains, dens, and abysses of the earth. There were many deaths, but the most merciful Lord, according to his usual goodness, always delivered me with a strong hand and a high my arm. At the very beginning of my desert life, as soon as my friend and I came in the spring to Nagib, a remote and deserted desert where at that time there was no one except wild animals of all kinds, which would, being disturbed by anyone in great numbers, fearlessly and calmly walked in large herds through the lush valleys of the deserted Nagib. 
We made ourselves a booth near the grave of Father Titus. It was, one might say, in our times, the first hermit of the Caucasus Mountains. A year before this, he left New Athos, and here, in complete silence and distance from people, he ended his suffering life, having lived here for only six months. My comrade immediately left, and I was left completely alone, so now there was not a single person within a hundred miles around me. One evening I was sitting in a booth in a prayerful mood. There was dead silence everywhere. The sun, completing its usual daily path, was already low, when suddenly a terrible roar of an animal like the roar of a lion was heard on the right side of me at the top of the mountain and rolled out in peals throughout the valleys of Nagib. My whole body was covered in frost, and I trembled with fear. I immediately realized that it was a bloodthirsty leopard, which, sensing a person in the possessions of its region, makes efforts to drive him out. After some time, a roar was heard further down the mountainside, then even lower and lower. Apparently, the animal was jumping down to the bottom, approaching me closer and closer. An inscrutable fear struck me completely, and like a dead person I lay motionless in anticipation of imminent death. There was nowhere to look for protection, and the booth was so small that my feet were sticking out. I turned to the heavenly help of Almighty God, and my prayer did not remain in vain, for I firmly remembered the word of wise men that the Lord never leaves a person in need. And indeed, the beast, having descended to the bottom of the valley, raged for a considerable time, running with frenzy and fury around my booth, and was seen by me in the clearings not far from my place. But it was clear that the power of God did not allow him to rush at me and tear me to pieces, and I continued to pray in my heart to the Lord God for mercy. Finally, having exhausted all its efforts, the beast turned to the side, and as if driven by whips, ran into the depths of the forest with incredible speed, echoing the entire surrounding country with a terrible roar, so that its speed was barely audible to the distance. And so, by the grace of God, the mortal danger passed. Another case was of this nature. I had to return from the secular village of Vesioli after communion of the Holy Mysteries of Christ to my hermitage, to the same Nagib. There was no road there then, as there is now. I made my way up the slope with incredible difficulty through the dense forest, crossing ravines and precipices, climbing over rocks and cliffs, and when I was halfway there, suddenly the weather changed. It snowed, it rained, the wind began to roar, the forest began to shake, filling the air with great noise. All nature began to move as if taking revenge on man for his sin. I sat down, wet to the bone, not having the strength to go further. Meanwhile, evening was approaching and a terrifying darkness fell over the forest. The wind driving snow clouds through the gorges with some terrible ghosts, even more, and as it were, completely frightened my spirit. Mortal fear shackled me and horror penetrated my entire being. There was no place to wait for help. Death was inevitable. I had to freeze. But I really didn't want to die. Firstly, with full consciousness and complete surprise, and most importantly, with a strong desire to still live and work for the sake of eternal salvation in the exploits and hardships of a desert life. I got up and walked, but I took ten steps and I fell to the ground in exhaustion. Because the bag on my shoulders was, according to the custom of our life, more than a pound, so I struggled, falling and getting up, until complete darkness came. Exhausted, I lay down on the ground, all wet, having no hope of staying alive. So I laid covered in snow, in unspeakable suffering, until the morning. But by the will of Almighty God, who resurrects the dead and gave breath to every creature, I remained alive. Only my legs and arms froze, and it was impossible to stand on my feet. Therefore I crawled on my stomach for quite some time, until little by little my frozen limbs came to life, and so moving little by little with great difficulty, I barely reached my cell, where I recovered, giving heartfelt thanks to the all-good providence of the Heavenly Father, who does not leave us in our needs. 
Once again, I had to cross the Psebe Pass. This required me, according to my strength, at least three days. Towards the evening of the next day, when I, having once crossed the Black River, was approaching its top, where it was necessary to cross it again, heavy rain hit, a strong wind blew, deep darkness fell and covered the entire country. All possibility of going further ceased. I sat down under a tree, all wet, as if up to my neck in water. Around midnight I heard a bear coming. Sensing me with his nose, he approached me kindly, as if compassionately, and sniffed me all over, and calmly walked on, on his own deliberate path, without feeling any ill-suffering for the severity of the bad weather. I, a sinner, envied this oak forest beast, that it imputes cruel suffering, from which a person often dies to nothing. In the morning, approaching the river, he noticed with horror that it was impossible to cross it. It was flooded and presented a terrifying vision. It ran with the speed of an arrow and carried large stones in its movement. What was there left to do? And there was nothing to wait for, because here none of the people would walk or drive. And besides, I only had enough bread in my bag to eat for one day. Finding myself in a difficult situation facing an insurmountable obstacle, I again, out of necessity, even if I didn't want to, had to turn to the heavenly help of Almighty God. And here is tangible proof that desert life in these similar cases has incomparable superiority over other types of spiritual life, precisely because it involuntarily forces a person to turn to the Lord with a prayer for help, which having certainly received, he is convinced with his own eyes that the endless mercy of God and the vigilant providence of God constantly cares for each of us. The inspiring words of the Great Father, the mentor of the desert dwellers, St. Isaac the Syrian, came to my mind, as if by itself faith in God makes a person the Son of God, and that he then autocratically disposes of all created nature. Faith was given the opportunity to create a new creation, and she really showed the world the miracles of God. She walked along the ridge of the sea as if on dry land, and entered the fire without suffering any harm. And besides, the Lord himself says, All things are possible to him who believes. I prayed to the Lord God and his most blessed mother, the zealous intercessor of the whole world, undoubtedly believing in my heart that he never leaves us sinners. He called for help and quickly in troubles the assistant of Christ, St. Nicholas, protected us and uh, the watery aspiration which was terrible to gaze upon with the sign of the cross. He took a long stick in his hands and fearlessly entered the depths of the river. The water was up to my chest, and according to the natural state of affairs, there was no way for me to stay on my feet, but to be carried away by the water and smashed against the stones, just as many of our desert dwellers suffered from this very thing at different times. But the power of God miraculously held me in the midst of the raging elements. I stood like a rock in the midst of the terrible pressure of water, easily crossed the mortal danger, and according According to my custom, gave heartfelt thanks to the life-giver God, who always does great and glorious deeds. Many times getting lost in the wilds, he was in danger of death from lack of water. One day I went to visit the brethren who lived in the upper reaches of the Mizinta River. Due to the onset of fog, I lost my way and entered an impenetrable wilderness where I climbed looking for a way out until the evening, but only went deeper and deeper into rapids and abysses. From extreme exhaustion, a mortal languor set in. I lay down on the ground, not expecting to be alive because my insides were burning with unbearable thirst, as if scorched by fire, and I endured inscrutable suffering. Seeing myself in great trouble, threatening imminent death, I turned to heavenly help. I began to pray to the life-giver, the Lord, as I had never prayed before. Relentlessly, the thirst stopped. I felt a revival of strength in myself, and thus the mortal danger passed. I remembered that I spent that night on the highest mountain in a spiritual state and in the rapture of spirit in prayer to the Lord. The night was moonlit, quiet, beautiful. Nature performed the usual service to the 
creator, silently glorifying his endless perfections. The neighboring mountain spears stood somehow gloomily and silently. Some of them were covered with forest, and their gloomy appearance, like a mysterious region of the invisible world, struck the soul with the impression of something hidden, impenetrable, but full of life and activity, unknown to anyone, just as spiritual life is hidden in man from human view, but moves in the heart visible to the one God. Below in the clearings the cheerful singing of grasshoppers could be heard. These vigilant singers of divine glory are so zealous in fulfilling their duty that they absolutely do not stop their work for a minute throughout the night, filling the air with an inimitable sweet sound. Here we truly see God's wisdom. The herbal Kazyavochka is the smallest and produces such a beautiful organ of singing that no human art, no sage or artist can create, and they were echoed by the swamp frogs, whose countless voices in their multitude of diversity resounded in a friendly and solemn chorus between the peaks of the mountains, and this filled the soul with the delight of the purest pleasure, which the soul experiences in general from the effect of everything beautiful on it. The Black Sea was visible in the distance. It rested majestically in its bosom, as if a mighty giant was resting after a military deed. The moon illuminated its surface with a pale light. Black dots were occasionally visible. The ships were passing by. The sight of the sea brought the soul into a state of peace, silence, and tranquility, and produced a joyful and gratifying impression, and gave birth to deep and varied thoughts in the mind. Looking at this, that sea of life, raised by a adversity and storm also came to mind and just as this after a terrible storm and excitement when its waves rise to heaven and descend to the abysses it is now peaceful and serene so it happens with a person after a rebellion of passions comes spiritual silence and heavenly calm of course when he tries to the best of his ability for his salvation in the sky the full moon flowing out from behind the mountains flooded the surroundings with silvery light Sitting on the top of the mountain above all the earthly world, which no doubt at that time was all immersed in sleep, I again saw with the spiritual eyes of my heart the multi-artistic wisdom of God, so generously revealed in visible nature. I recalled the wondrous words of a lofty human mind, once read long ago, and what was depicted there in word I now saw in reality. Deep sadness about the loss of some kind of bliss passes throughout the entire kingdom of being, and incomprehensible in the lower realms of creation, which each higher degree becomes more intelligible and finally receives its true interpretation in holy tradition. The winds howl sadly, the waters of the sea rumble, plants with their entire lives express a thirst for life and light, and in this thirst they become exhausted and die. Animals resound in the air, pitiful songs, then cries of rage. Peoples pass on to each other the story of a golden age, about some crime, about the invasion of evil, and finally, the Holy Scripture clearly says that man was blessed and immortal, but lost both by transgressing the commandments of God. God is the only source of life for every creature, and especially for man. Man could not live an immortal life without drawing it from the ever-flowing source, but he could not draw it without immersing himself like a vessel with humble obedience and love in the will of God. Therefore obedience to the will of God occurs together with the perception of divine life in oneself. Life itself, on the contrary, disobedience to the will of God is at the same time moving away from the source of life, which is death. Until the first man violated the commandments of God, he ate from the fruits of the tree of life and was immortal. He put a proud spirit into his heart, sparked a spark of self-exaltation and disobedience, and he threw off the yoke of reason and the will of God. Then the source of life moved away from him, and an unquenchable thirst with each age intensifying for the lost goods that were revealed, which seeks quenching in the sensory world or in the spiritual world. In both cases it draws the soul from the circle of bodily life into eternity. From the collection of the Kiev Academy. Once I fell into the abyss with my bag, and if I had not hung on to a tree, I would have fallen to death. I barely got out of there, covered in blood. I was ill for quite some time.
There was much more, but in order not to burden my attention with the length of my speech, I need to cover in silence all other incidents that happened to me in my life. The end of this word is that in all adventures and mortal dangers, the almighty right hand of the Most High has always guarded me wonderfully and supernaturally. So the word of the Holy Scriptures came true for me. It says, The Lord God, the holiest one of Israel, I will go before you. I will break in pieces the gates of brass. I will erase the verges of hell, I will level the mountains, and I will make the paths of trouble smooth. Or as another saying of the Holy Scripture says, Do not be afraid, my son Jacob, my servant Israel, do not be afraid, for I have delivered you, I have called you by my name, for you are mine, and even if you pass through water, I am with you, and the rivers will not cover you, and even if you walk through fire, you will not be burned, and the flame will not consume you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, who will save you. Isaiah 43, 2-3, And indeed, according to the word of St. Isaac of Syria, nowhere will a person see the wonderful providence of God above him so clearly and tangibly as in the desert, in a country deprived of all human consolation, in difficult circumstances of life, where no earthly power can help. Here the Lord always royally and dominantly reveals his power and stretches out his saving right hand. St. Isaac of Syria beautifully and wonderfully discusses this providence of God with the spiritual eyes of his heart, who saw it hourly in his deserted silence. Chapter 34 Praise of the Caucasian Desert Speaking about the desert and about life in it, we are not talking for everyone, but only for some of us who have in our souls the seed of this life, that is, an innate inclination towards solitude, silence, distance from people, in general the ability for a concentrated inner life. And this, as you know, is a special class of people, not quite similar to others. Most people live outside, but the rational hermit dwells within himself, preserving the pure thoughts of his mind and the holy feelings of his heart. He stands before the face of God, whom he sees in the midst of his heart, as the holy prophet Elijah says about himself, As the Lord of hosts lives, I stand before him this day. 3 Kings 18.15. In order to live profitably in the desert, it is necessary to first become familiar with the entire course of monastic life, to know its rules and all the regulations, the performance of services, and to be experienced in all matters of monastic life and in all behavior in it. But this is still only external, like a fence for the church, because even more you need to be skilled in mental warfare and have the ability to overcome enemy thoughts. The the weapon for defeating which is the Jesus prayer, the training of which must begin long before entering the desert and brought to at least half of its success. We need to recognize our extremely decisive weakness in everything related to spiritual matters, and in general everything that relates to the creation of our salvation, and to the extent of this consciousness strongly feel all the need and absolute necessity for God's help, and ask for it with all our hearts and with all the strength of our strength strength, in the undoubtable hope that he who does not want the death of a sinner, Ezekiel 33:11 through 12 the Lord will never despise the prayer of the one who prays, as he himself says in his sacred gospel, everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened, Matthew 7, 8 through 9. It seems to be an extreme regret that all those of us who came here without knowing why live in the desert almost without fruit or with little benefit. For their sake this most sublime spiritual order of monastic life endures much reproach, which in the order of spiritual progress occupies the highest degree, unless of course it proceeds correctly, legally, and in accordance with its purpose. They, not knowing what the purpose of the desert is and what needs to be achieved here, go into various works, considering them their primary work, saying that our salvation is in work, and thereby close the true path of desert life, serving as a temptation and stumbling block for the weakest brethren. They do not know what St. Isaac the Syrian says about this. If we live according to our calling, then the world, like a slave, will serve us, bringing everything we need from bodily life. The content of the desert is the constant practice of the Jesus prayer, according to the teaching of St. John Climacus, that silence is unceasing servants to God. 
the monastic rule itself must be subject to its action, that is, if it resides royally in the soul and flows in streams of unceasing movement, carrying with it all the spiritual forces, or most likely our inner man, then according to the teaching of the Holy Fathers, there is no need to pay attention to your rule, but to remain in this prayer, as if in the abyss of divine satiety. This state is above all our exploits and activities. It is the goal towards which the entire monastic life is directed so that if one of us is abundant in this prayerful grace, then he does not need to fulfill his rule, which serves only as a means to do this. And here is our advice to the hermit, remain in this prayer and it will show you the whole path to salvation, how to come to God. She will show you through the confusion of her heart, its illness and burden, what is harmful and not useful to salvation. She will also show you a brightly joyful state of mind when you are following your path correctly. She is a spiritual light that dims at the slightest admission of anything displeasing to God, but it, she shines brightly with the sparkles of unquenchable joy when you stand right before God. You keep your thoughts pure and keep the feelings of your heart sacred and you will see God your creator in the sanctuary of your soul. Consequently, living in the desert, each of us needs to listen to the inner Jesus prayer with all the zeal and strength of our strength, and it, like a guiding star, will lead us unerringly to the haven of eternal salvation. If a hermit is alien to intelligent work, that is, practicing the Jesus prayer, then he, in the words of St. Seraphim of Sarov, is a burnt brand, and will be condemned more than all people, as having taken upon himself the high title of a hermit, he turned out to be unfit. Therefore, all hermits must necessarily be practitioners of the Jesus prayer, experienced in it, able to tell anyone who asks everything concerning its production. And therefore, the desert is not for everyone, but only for the chosen ones, whose preliminary life has sufficiently prepared for the inner life with God. Keeping them in mind, and even more so ourselves, we left this praise to her so that in moments and hours of relaxation and spiritual overwhelming, we could pour cheerfulness into our souls, generously, joyfully, and boldly endure its hardships, burdens, and sometimes painful despondency, this death of the soul and hellish torment. And so, having called on the help of Almighty God and His all-pure Mother, we begin our song in praise of the Caucasian desert, from the feeling that we experienced after being deprived of it, having left for a short time in the Russian borders. Chapter 35 My Feelings After the Deprivation of the Desert when, due to leaving for Russia, I had to leave the desert, only then did I recognize its heavenly dignity, incomparable beauty, and the fullness of true life hidden in it, which flows in abundant rivers of the purest pleasure, in the sublime feelings of the heart, and in the holy thoughts of the mind. Then, after deprivation, the desert seemed to me like the village of God and the heavenly Eden, from which Adam was expelled for the sake of disobedience, and how he sat then right in paradise, in the sorrow of his heart, and mourning his nakedness, sobbing, said, Paradise, my paradise, red paradise. So I, sitting at the station, or on railway trains, or sailing on the sea on ships, surrounded by rumors and storms of the sea of life, raised by misfortunes of passions, recalled the time of my life spent in the desert, and it seemed to me covered with rays of heavenly bliss, and in the inscrutable suffering of my heart I spoke the words of the long-suffering Job, who will order me according to the months of former days, in which God preserves me, as when his lamp shone above my head, when I walked with his light in darkness. Job 29, 2-3 then streams of heavenly joy and heavenly bliss flowed in my heart. When living in the desert, I ate heavenly manna and drank the water of life from the ever-flowing source, Christ the Son of God, containing in my mind and heart His divine and magnificent name. And I partook of this the time of a higher life, and I clearly saw the dawn of eternal salvation, which is not even a sign in everything around me now. So therefore I voluntarily fell from heaven to earth, from a blissful state to a painful one, from a spiritual life to a carnal one scattered, and when I passed through hailstorms or rode in a carriage, a sea of vanity was around me, and every feeling of the soul was struck and deafened by heavy impressions, as if by the blows of a terrible hammer. Everything moved, hurried forward with a fast and unstoppable desire. 
Over the entire popular movement lay a deadening funeral veil, penetrating the soul and all its forces with icy cold, leading to a state of mortality. And of course it was the absence of all rationality, much less spirituality. It was the dominion of the vanity and the life of this age. In this suffocating atmosphere, my spirit felt shackled with iron chains, and I truly experienced hellish torment, because my every movement towards God was suppressed by all kinds of voices of jubilant vanity, just as fire is suppressed by water. It was precisely from this state that I clearly saw what a desert life is, although of course not for everyone, but who, while living in it, has developed in his soul an inner sense of the spirit by which the voice of nature is heard, broadcasting the greatness of God, and who has revealed in his soul the ability to listen with the hearing of the heart to the presence of God as close to us as our breath is close to us. In this sensation of the divine, our spirit partakes of the eternal life and hears its immortality, which allows it to experience those most sublime moments of inner life, which make the desert so dear to us that all bodily suffering in it becomes almost insensitive. It is impossible to find words to express exactly how far one is from the other. It would not be wrong to say that no matter how far the east is from the west, the desert silence surpasses and rises above the vanity of this world. Here is the death of the spirit, and there is its resurrection. Here is the complete dominion of the prince of this age, and in the desert God's dwelling, heavenly sweetness and holy communion with God. In the world there is an uncontrollable effervescence of passions, and only one broad development of everything that is needed for this temporary life is seen, as if there is no thought about the future century. The desert, by the absence of all this, involuntarily draws a person from earth to heaven. It deprives all the feelings of the soul for the food that it needs, through which the life of the spirit is possible. And what an indescribable happiness I considered for myself if the opportunity arose to be transported there and again be in the depths of it, to reach its limits and die on its border. I was completely transformed into fiery desire, but this was impossible for me now. From this comes the conclusion that no matter what kind of suffering one has to endure in the desert, it is nothing more than a spark against a flame, or like a single drop of water against a great sea. But here it must be said that this comparison is by no means for everyone. But nothing more than that I express my personal state and attitude to the matter, which cannot be applied to others according to their spiritual dispositions and inclinations of the heart. The word of Abba Dorotheos is justified that it is good to sit in the cell, and it is good to leave it to visit the brethren, because by comparing the opposites the price of reasonable silence is known, which is seen as the true life of the soul, full of spiritual content and completely quenching the eternal thirst of the soul in its aspiration to the supreme good, God. The holy prophet Elijah beholds God with his hose standing before the face of Ahab, the wicked king of Israel, for he says, As the Lord lives, I stand before him today with my mind and heart. But he sees God more, more vividly and clearly on the deserted Mount Horeb, and not just seeing, but even talks with him. For the Lord says to him, Why are you here, Elijah? And he answers, Jealous, jealous of the Lord God Almighty. 1 Kings 19.10. Desert silence is a foreshadowing of the life of the coming century, as the Holy Father says. Silence is the sacrament of the coming century, and it would be fitting here to sing a new song of God's praise in praise of the desert life for the affirmation of those living in it. But alas, from a darkened mind and a sin-stricken heart, no word can come out. For the scripture says, praise from the lips of the wicked is not comely. But it will not be reprehensible to say about this according to your strength, and partly in the words of Holy Scripture. Rejoice, thirsty desert, let the desert rejoice, and let it flourish like a flower. And the desert of Jordan will flourish and rejoice, and the glory of Lebanon will be given to it, and the honor of Carmel. And my people will see the glory of the Lord and the height of God. Strengthen your weakened hands and scattered knees. Take comfort in your mind. Be strong, do not be afraid. Behold, our God will reward judgment. 
he will come and save us. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf will hear. Then he will ride the lame like a tree, and the tongue of those who perish will be clear, like the water that has burst forth in the desert, and the wilds in a thirsty land. And there will be waterless swamps, and there will be a spring of water on the thirsty land. There will be a dwelling place for birds, and flocks of camels, and husks. The path will be clear, and the path will be called holy, and it will not pass here, but scattered people will follow it and will not go astray, and there will be no wild beast, neither will evil beasts come upon it, and it will not be found, but they will walk along it in deliverance and gathering together. Lord, they will turn and come to Zion with joy, and eternal joy is upon their head, for praise and joy are upon their heads, and I accept joy, sickness and sorrow and sighing escape. Isaiah 35. Chapter 36, Thoughts and Feelings of a Hermit at his Farewell to the Abandonment in which he lived for many years, also with your spiritual father, the Agumen of the Monastery, and with all the Monastery, his dear brotherhood, and together continuing the praise of the desert. I am aware and fully feel, blessed fathers, what a fiery arrow I am piercing into your heart by my departure into the desert, to serve God, because it is not unknown to me that you love me more than anyone else from the entire monastic brotherhood. But having called upon your aid the boundless grace of Almighty God and our Savior Jesus Christ, complacently bear this blow as you endure by the will of God and all other sorrows, troubles, and heartfelt embitterments from the divine providence entrusted to your leadership of the verbal flock of Christ. Our most dear Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who chose me from my mother's womb to serve himself and place in the nature of my soul the seed for a solitary desert life, sees and knows this very reason why I am leaving you, my dear Father, far from the closest to my heart as the one who gave birth to me spiritually than my carnal parents. I also leave the holy monastery where I quietly and serenely spent the dear days of my youth protected by God's peace and grace, far from the world and its temptations. I also leave to me my dear brothers with whom I lived in harmony for many years, working together to the best of my ability for the common benefit of the monastery. And this reason, as our all-sweet Savior Jesus Christ sees, is my love for him, the dearest visitor of our souls, recognized by me in his all-holy name, which I began to call upon within my heart, praying the Jesus prayer according to the teachings of all the Holy Fathers. This name revealed to me a new, boundless, hitherto unknown to me area of spiritual existence and life, in which every spiritual being lives, the whole angelic world and all the holy people of God from time immemorial. Now this holy monastery, my spiritual and dear mother, cannot hold me in its bosom, because it cannot satisfy and satiate the spiritual aspirations of my heart, as the Lord, the knower of the heart, sees this. The desert alone and it alone is capable and sufficient to saturate my soul with heavenly manna, which I have been looking for since my youth, and only now have tasted, albeit in a small part. But having tasted it, I can no longer live as I lived before, because I felt in the name of Jesus Christ eternal life and the kingdom of heaven. Just as at the beginning, at the dawn of my days, I left, moved by God's beckoning, my parents and all the bread of this world, and went to the monastery. So now the same divine uncontrollably moves me with an inner impulse and calls me into the desert to celebrate Christ's Pascha. Then there is to live a mental life in the heart with Christ, which is impossible in the monastery due to material occupation, which removes one from prayer. Didn't my relatives cry for me as if I were dead when destroying their hopes for their earthly happiness? I uncontrollably strove to the holy monastery, but who can resist the will? of God. So the same thing is happening here, and no one can resist the will of the Almighty God. And so forgive me, my dearest Father, that I thrust a fiery arrow into your heart. Forgive me, my dear brothers, I was separated from you by a bitter, heavy, and joyless separation. But the Lord himself speaks about this separation in his holy gospel. Do you remember that peace was brought to the earth, but the sword, henceforth they will be divided in one house, three into two, and two into three, father will be divided against son and daughter, daughter against mother, 
Luke 12, 51 through 53. Everyone knows these words, and this very thing is now happening to me. Forgive me, I separated from your company, flew away like an eagle from its flock into the mountains, forests, and dens, having within my heart a wound and an uncontrollable desire for the divine sacred rite of mental heartfelt prayer. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, a heavenly drop of spiritual dew fell from the immortal oceans of God's goodness and onto my dead soul, and it rose up and was revived by the hope of eternal salvation, and joyfully looks and confidently extends its aspirations to enter that boundless and immeasurable abyss of spiritual life, which is hidden in the desert, to no one knowledgeable from people, but only to its participants. This sacred spirit fire of spiritual love kindled in the heart of a person by the omnipotent hand of the life giver does not go out but spreading in all directions in height and depth can no longer be contained within the narrow confines of the monastery but requires an unlimited scope of activity for which only the desert is sufficient and so do not mourn me by leaving this sacred monastery i am not bringing dishonor to your life but i am fulfilling god's eternal predestination for me as the holy the Apostle Paul says, God chose us before the foundation of the world to the praise of the glory of His grace. Ephesians 1 4. Do not think, my dear Father, that anyone could live in the desert without having this divine seed given to him from the right hand of the Most High at his birth. Without this, even if someone went to this sublime feat of spiritual life, it is necessary to turn back, and whoever has it cannot be kept. And so following this divine spark embedded in the nature of my soul, I fearlessly leave the sacred monastery and boldly invade and embrace, or rather the very womb of the desert, where the unquenchable light of the magnificent divine name of Jesus Christ shines unquenchably, where springs of goodness flow, where oceans of pure spiritual joy flow about God our Savior, where there is no worldly vanity, and from where all earthly worries flee, and silence reigns, and a deepening of the mind and heart in God, and a spiritually joyful heartfelt union is with Him. True, there is no bodily rest and contented food here, but for this there is the highest pleasure in heavenly spiritual consolation, unknown to anyone except those living in the desert. Here the flower of Christ's love flourishes, grows, and flaunts, ever-living, fragrant, life-giving, spreading. It fills all deserted places, and for the sake of God, those living there with streams of heavenly joy. Here a well-fed calf is slain, and the wise virgins, shining with silence the orderliness of their thoughts, the virginal purity of their hearts, light lamps with the oil of spiritual virtues, sincere love for Christ and their neighbors. They cheerfully and joyfully set out at midnight for the meeting of their heavenly bridegroom, and having entered the palace, rejoice with all the heavenly powers in joy for their eternal salvation. But putting all this together, let's say briefly, here, vigilantly, day and night, the incense of spiritual service to the Lord Jesus of heartfelt service uh, rises like smoke. Here man stands guard over his eternal salvation, free from the temptations of the world and all its cares. With a pure mind and an enlightened heart, I take out and steadily look towards the eternal light of the unsetting sun of truth, which enlightens every person, and what else can I say? Here the joy of eternal salvation is anticipated. Man enters into the depths of his spiritual nature, into the sanctuary of the spirit, behind the second veil of the tabernacle, into which the high priest entered once a year. And here he sees the mysteries of God, great and ineffable, directly standing before the face of God with the vision of his mind in the heart and the temple of his inner man. However, it should be noted that all these sublime feelings and a supernatural holy state completely belong only to spiritual husbands and wives who have cleansed their hearts of passions and through their preliminary life have prepared themselves for a spiritually contemplative life. They alone can be called true children of the desert. To them she reveals her heavenly treasures and spiritual secrets. 
She makes them rest in her bosom, nourishes the milk of spiritual rebirth, and nothing will separate such chosen ones of the desert from this saving comfort. And so, having expressed this praise of the Caucasian desert, we once again address our warning so that anyone, having read about this, is not prematurely carried away into the desert, leaving his peaceful stay in the monastery. We present evidence from the Holy Father's scripture. Great among the fathers, St. John Climacus writes in detail about who can go into the desert. He, showing eight reasons why people go into the desert, recognizes only one of them is correct, and this is love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And if he says someone has guile, hypocrisy, anger, deceit, he should not even smell the desert air. The Holy Fathers were most afraid and warned against entering the desert prematurely because this would result in either enemy deception or spending life completely uselessly. If gradualism is required in everything and everywhere, then it is even more necessary in the matter of spiritual growth. Let us decorate the end of this word with the words of the universal teacher, like our Father among the saints, Basil the Great. He says, O oh, solitary life, the home of heavenly teaching and divine understanding, a school in which God is everything we learn. The desert is a paradise of sweetness, where the fragrant flowers of love either glow with a fiery color or shine with snow-like purity. With them is peace and silence. They live in unchanging, they remain motionless from the wind. They are the incense of perfect mortification, not only of the flesh, but what is more glorious of the will itself, and the censer of everlasting prayer incessantly flares up in him with divine love. Chapter 37 A Warning Against Going Into the Desert Early Another warning, and all about the same thing, on the occasion of extreme apprehension and fear, so that someone carried away by the beauty of the desert image does not leave his many useful stays in the monastery, being in obedience and working according to his strength, for the general benefit of the monastery, to which young monks and novices are especially prone, thinking due to their extreme foolishness that having hastened into the desert, they will immediately become partakers of the highest perfection. But this is impossible, for just as in bodily life growth occurs gradually, so this is even more so in spiritual life. Leaps are impossible. What is required is a gradual ascent from the lowest to the highest, and not vice versa. All these beautiful, many others not like the best of these desert blessings described in the previous chapter, are not for everyone living in the desert, but only those chosen ones reach them and taste them, who have purified their hearts with a preliminary pious life in the world, whether having lived in fulfillment of the Lord's commandments or in a monastery under the experienced guidance of spiritual elders in sincere obedience and cutting off one's will and wisdom from which true humility is gained, without which salvation is not possible for anyone. Then, in teaching himself the internal practice of the Jesus prayer, in the ability to overcome evil thoughts and keep his heart pure, he must come to a living consciousness of his fallen and corrupted state by sin, in which all the forces of his being uncontrollably strive for evil, against which there is no other remedy, as the only thing to unite with the Lord Jesus Christ, who gives us all divine powers, including life and godliness, 2 Peter 1, 3. He must be vividly aware of his inevitable need for God's help. If someone without such training enters the desert out of arbitrariness, frivolity, and a proud opinion of himself, falsely recognizing himself as capable, being in fact completely alien to all the qualities necessary for this, then great disaster befalls him, because instead of salvation he acquires death. Look what St. Isaac of Syria writes about this. The work of the cross is purely in accordance with the composition of nature divided into two parts. One consists of enduring sorrows with the body. It is accomplished by the action of spiritual strength, jealousy, and is called the act itself. The other is acquired by subtle work of the mind, constant thinking about God and staying in prayer. That is accomplished by the power of desire and is called vision. 
The first, that is action, purifies the passionate part of the soul through the power of zeal. The second cleanses the mental part of the soul through the action of spiritual love and spiritual desire. Everyone before perfect training in the first part, moving on to the second, carried away by its sweetness, not to say laziness, is subjected to anger and for not having first mortified his self, even on earth, that is, not having healed the weaknesses of his thoughts by patiently remaining in the act of reproach on the cross he dares to dream in his mind the glory of the cross this means saints if the mind wants to ascend to the cross before the feelings are healed from weakness then the wrath of god will befall it ascension to the cross then brings wrath when it is accomplished not by the first part of the endurance of sorrows or the crucifixion of the flesh but by the desire for vision the second part, which takes place after the healing of the soul. Such a mind is polluted by shameful passions and rushes towards dreams and thoughts of conceit. His path is blocked by a prohibition, because he did not first purify his mind with sorrows, did not subjugate carnal lusts, but from hearing and writing he rushed straight ahead into a path full of darkness, being himself blind. And those whose vision is sound, who are filled with light and have acquired mentors full of grace, they too suffer day and night. Their eyes are filled with tears, in prayer and weeping. They work day and night because of the dangers of the journey, because of the more terrible rapids they encounter, because of the images of truth that turn out to be mixed with its deceptive ghosts. God, the fathers say, comes by himself when you do not expect it. So, but if the place is clean and not defiled, and we, indeed, throughout our entire life in the desert have seen and testified that such people suffer unspeakable distress in their spiritual state, futility, and deprivation. The most faithful image to them is of a fledgling chick that has fallen prematurely from the nest. Instead of flying to a height according to the structure of his avian nature, he pathetically drags along the earth until he becomes food for animals. The same inevitably happens to young monks and novices who leave the monastery prematurely without having learned the spiritual work. They not only spend their lives fruitlessly, but worst of all, they become incapable of any other life. Sometimes they return to the monastery to live as before, but they can no longer do so. Again they go to the desert, and then again to the monastery, like a reed shaken by the wind. They bend and throw themselves in all directions, but nowhere do they find peace and rest. Until the end they surrender to despair, into debauchery, negligence, and into a carnal sinful life. We see these sad experiences in abundance. Although we have shown the desert in its true state and corresponding to its purpose, at the same time we clearly show its opposite state, so that captivated by its beauty we do not rush prematurely into its holy embrace. It is the same as without having studied the elementary sciences you cannot enter the higher classes, study theology at the academy because there we will not be able to understand anything. The worst thing is when someone else takes on the desert life alone, but woe to one, says the scripture, Ecclesiastes 4.12, and St. Climacus says, just as one who does not have a guide conveniently errs on his path, even if he is very smart, so he who goes arbitrarily along the path of monasticism easily perishes, even if he knew all the wisdom of this world. Not false signs of a hermit, a natural inclination towards solitude, silence, distance from people, a love of prayer that so embraces his entire soul that he considers it the very first thing in his life and prefers it to all of his other deeds and exercises. Staying in it constitutes peace, joy, and the essence of life for him. And for his sake, she is the soil, the pier, and the elements, like water for fish and air for earthly creatures, deep knowledge of one's fallen nature, completely corrupted by sin, its complete incapacity for good and constant inclination towards evil, and hence a living feeling of the need for God's help and the need to unite one's soul with the Lord Jesus Christ, from whom alone this help can be given. Faith as strong as death in God's everlasting providence. No one can live in the desert without it. Complete trust not in oneself due to the knowledge of one's extreme weakness, but in God, patience of all kinds of hardship and finally complete devotion to the will of God. Chapter 38 About the comparative significance of the monastery community and the desert life. 
question. What advantage does desert life have over communal life, and what is the difference between them? Answer, great and incomparable. The hostel can be called the beginning and training of monastic life, and the desert the end and the perfection. The first, in the full meaning of the word, befits the name of a spiritual hospital and medical clinic, where every zealot for salvation who comes from the world heals his passions, mental ailments, and infirmities, in order to, having been cleansed, make his spirit capable of receiving and instilling in himself the divine Jesus prayer, which in monastic life constitutes the very top and perfection. The desert has as its main and root goal precisely this very exercise of doing the Jesus prayer, to continue, confirm, and strengthen in one's spirit, and bring it to perfection, make it unceasing, and through it unite your heart with the sweetest Redeemer, our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom eternal life and endless bliss are the urgent task of the rational living desert. In the hostel there is actually an active life that is exercise in bodily activities, labors, and works that contribute to the mortification of and the stifling of the passions, especially of self-love and pride, and this through submission to the monastic authority. Prayer here is performed in general by being present at church services, as far as the deeds assigned to each person by obedience allows, and by fulfilling the cell rule. The main virtue here is obedience, the complete cutting off of one's will before one's superiors, one's own wisdom, and in general all one's independence. And this truly lofty virtue is, as it were, the slaughter of one's soul, and leads to humility, without which salvation is impossible for any one. The venerable fathers, like the saints John Climaticus and St. Theodore the Studite, call monastic life spent in reason with full faith in one's mentors and cutting off of one's will a martyr's death. And of course there is nothing better for anyone who wants to achieve spiritual prosperity and eternal salvation than to live for many years in a monastery under the guidance of experienced spiritual elders, become accustomed to the inner Jesus prayer, and then, if it is God's will, go into the desert. In the desert we mean the absence of all bodily activities, earthly care, and any earthly entertainment, except for the most necessary things, without which bodily life cannot continue. The fundamental work of this life is, as said above, the unceasing internal practice of the Jesus prayer, or simply contemplative life, in living in holy communion with God, with a pure mind and an enlightened heart. There is, according to the word of St. John Climacus, unceasing service to God. The difference between them is seen in the fact that living an ordinary monastic life in a monastery, we do not have the opportunity to so easily, tangibly, and clearly see the never-ending providence of God, vigilantly caring for every person, because here everyone receives what he needs readily without any labor. When the time comes for eating, he goes to the common meal and eats the food offered, with thanksgiving to the Lord God. In the same way, having a need for clothes, he goes to the rag room, that is, the general warehouse of monastic clothes, and takes what he needs freely without any labor. From here it happens, especially with our inattentiveness, that we almost do not notice at all, or even do not consider it necessary to see the constant action of the Almighty's providence, vigilantly caring for every creature, especially the spiritual needs of rational beings, which, by the affinity of their spirit with the divine, have, as it were, an advantage over all other creations of God. He who lives in the desert, even if he is extremely inattentive, still necessarily sees this due to direct contact with both, and indeed the experience here is precious, undeniably convincing, and tangibly visible. For the glory of the inscrutable divine mercy we boldly testify, both on the basis of the entire patristic scripture and partly from our own experience, that the Lord absolutely never abandons those who trust in him, both in general, all people and equally and even predominantly those of them who accompany their lives for the sake of Christ's love and the salvation of their souls in the barely passable wilds of the forests, dens, and earthly abysses. Although I am the worst of all the hermits of the Caucasus and have not lived for many years, I have always seen the wondrous hand of God above me throughout my time as a desert dweller. Once we had to pass through empty, completely uninhabited places. The bread was exhausted and there was no way to satisfy the hunger in a natural way. 
One could only wait for the supernatural, and hope did not put him to shame. Evening came, looking around where to find a comfortable place to sleep. I saw a beautiful tree, and around it a small plain covered with dense green grass. It was summer. Approaching the tree, I felt that I had stepped on a stone with my foot. When I wanted to throw it aside, I took it with my hands. Then, to my great surprise, I saw that it was a small circle of bread, soft, warm, as if it had been taken out of the oven. This is one of many cases, because it is impossible to retell everything. St. Paisi Velichkovsky beautifully and inimitably makes a comparison between the inner and spiritual life produced inside the soul by the action of the Jesus prayer and the outer life that rests on the external fulfillment of the prayer rule, that is, on the reading of the Psalter, Canons, Traparia, Akathists. Thus he likens external life to a ship when it is near the shore tied with ropes and gives back to the city the cargo it has brought from afar. Anyone who wants to, freely, without any obstacle, enters it and leaves it, sees its entire position and what is in it, takes what he needs. A crowd of idle people mills noisily and aimlessly on the shore. Movement, noise, disorder, complete absence of any intelligent activity, in a word vanity common to this age. But this same ship, having laid down the cargo it had brought and being filled with new goods, set sail for the shore and went into the depths of the sea. All the bustle and crowds of people remained on the shore, and the ship appears lonely on the surface of the vast sea. One helmsman skillfully rules his aspiration. He walks and hurries further, and he had already disappeared from the gaze of the crowd. Nothing is visible but only the air and the sky, and the expanse of water, without measure in width, without end in length. The world and people remain far away, and the ship sails royally in boundless space. Waves and winds and storms beat him all around, but he doesn't care. He walks in deep silence among the expanses of water, in boundless space, and around him there is nothing visible where a weary gaze can stop, because only the water element and the sky are visible, and the boundless distance of the blue sea. The same similarity was shown by God in a spiritual vision to the monastery fathers in Egypt. The sacred silence of the mind from the life of the great silence in St. Arsenius who loved silence more than any other of the Holy Fathers, and the Lord was pleased to show us that this is the state of his mind it is more pleasing to him than other virtues. He saw himself alone on a ship sailing on the surface of the great sea, an unbreakable silence surrounded the ship and filled the entire country, spreading across the vast expanse the boundless sea. Nothing can be seen anywhere as if everything has frozen. It stands motionless, the air, the sea, and the firmament, and so Saint Arsenius, in the depths of the abyss of silence and general immobility, performed God's service with a pure mind and an enlightened heart, listening to the presence of the Holy Spirit, who, filling the entire universe, was with him at that time in a special influx, as the skeet ascetic saw, praying to God to find out whose life is higher and greater. Moses, like those of the robbers who accepted and pleased everyone for the sake of Christ's love, or Arseni, who ran away from everyone and sent away even those who came to him for spiritual benefit. You just need to know that very few people are capable of such silence. This is a natural talent, according to which a person naturally gravitates within himself, and avoiding human communication and distraction, uncontrollably strives into the depths of silence, into solitude and loneliness. And what is unbearable and sorrowful for others is desirable, sweet, and incomparable to him. Being with people is painful for him. Conversations and company are unbearable because here the life of the spirit is necessarily suppressed by vanity and rumor, which torments him with unbearable burden, and he seeks silence like a fish of water or like a man parched with thirst for a drop of water. In silence our spirit freely stretches out and goes to God, unrestrainedly directing all its strength towards him and will unite with him, an indescribable and mysterious union. The Holy Fathers could not find sufficient words to adequately praise this great virtue, and this is a highly pleasing and desired state of the soul, when while remaining in it, it directs its inner strength to God. St. Isaac the Syrian writes, If you put all the affairs of your life on one scale, that of silence, of course reasonable, God-thought silence, 
on the other, then know that it will outweigh all of your deeds in spiritual fullness and heaviness. St. Climacus and all the Holy Fathers in general praise him no less. A man who is silent is a man of much understanding. The lover of silence approaches God, and secretly conversing with him is enlightened by him. And Holy Scripture gives great praise to silence. Healing the tongue is a tree of life. If you keep it, you will be filled with the Spirit. The Holy Apostle Peter makes silence a distinctive feature of the inner life and hidden man. 1 Peter 3, 4. Indeed, silence enclosing a person within himself and concentrating his inner activity in himself imparts to him the fullness of inner life and special strength and fortitude of spirit and serves as the best means to success and perfection and to the growth of the inner man. This is a much desired state but few such men are found, and they are chosen from people, initiated into the secrets of Holy Scripture, in the depths of which they find God. Therefore, when this great man, St. Arseni, prayed to God, being in the royal chambers, and when he came to the Hermitage Desert in Egypt, Lord, teach me how to be saved, then the omniscient, seeing his natural inclination to silence, said to him, Be silent, run away from people, and move away from everyone. These are the roots of sinlessness. And indeed, not one of God's holy saints has ever moved away from people as much as this great man, inimitable in his virtue. The Holy Fathers in their writings about spiritual life very often cite him as an example, calling him equal to the angels and citing striking examples from his life. One day the Patriarch came to visit the great Arsenius with one of his superiors from Alexandria. The saint sat and did not say a word. The Patriarch, breaking the silence, said, Father, say a word for our benefit. Arsenius replied, Will you listen to me when I say this? They promised. The holy man says, If you hear where Arsenius is, then do not approach that place. And he didn't say anything more. With that, the distinguished visitors left. Another time it happened that a novice who had come knocked on the cell of the Holy Father, of course wanting to hear the words of salvation from him. Arsenius, thinking that it was his employee, opened the door, and then he saw that it was not him. He fell face down on the ground and lay there. The newcomer asks, Get up, Father. I won't get up the saint answers, until you leave. What explains such actions, which, in our opinion, are alien to brotherly love? His inexpressible love for Christ, from whom he could not be separated for even one moment. I love you, he said to his brothers, to justify his actions, but I cannot be with you and with God. In heaven everyone has one will, although there are billions of celestials, and people each have their own will. Once they notice him, he talks to the hermits, asks about their thoughts. The brethren, surprised, said to him, How are you, having studied all the sciences and knowing the Greek and Roman language as well, seeking advice from these unlearned people? It's true, the great man replied, that I have studied all the wisdom of this age, but I still don't know the primer of that high science in which these seemingly poor men are involved.